All right, TBC, how we feeling? Everybody feeling good? Awesome. Man, it's so great to be with you guys today. And um, I'm particularly excited because we're, uh, we're in, a, in a series on relationships. Um, and that hits all of us, right? Sometimes you get up and preach and you're like, well, this might hit maybe two-thirds of you guys. But like every one of us are dealing with and walking in relationships. So whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're widowed, whether, whatever your relationship status is, this series has been really good for everybody and it's going to continue to be really good for everybody. You guys enjoyed the past couple of weeks. Has it been good? Man, that's the loudest amen that I think you've ever gotten. We're talking about sex and everybody's like, amen. <laughs> we're going to, oh man, we're going to have some fun today. And, um, and my hope is, is that today is going to be encouraging to you, that it's going to be hope filled for you, that it's going to um, inject some uh, life and light and healing into your relationships. Um, I love marriage, love, love, love marriage. And, um, you know, I've had a unique uh, journey when it comes to marriage. I've been, I've been married twice. I'm in my second marriage. My first marriage, I, I had um, a wonderful, wonderful, amazing bride for seven years. And then, and she was, um, she passed away in 2015. And then I was single for two years. So I was trying to navigate some of that uh, those waters a little bit as a widow and a single dad, and then remarried in 2017 and blended our families. And so, you, you know, you kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of hitting all the relationship statuses <laughs> over here. And, um, and, and what's unique about that is my wife now, Christy, her first marriage ended in divorce. And so we've, we, we have learned a whole lot through this process. And, and marriage is not easy. Amen. Um, <laughs> amen. <laughs> But it's worth it, right? It's worth it. And I'll tell you why it's worth it, because God loves marriage. Um, God has set up marriage as the primary way to show off his love for his people. And, and that's what marriage is for. Marriage is to show the world this is, this is how much God loves his people, that he's relentless in his pursuit of his people. There's an unconditional um, unrelenting love from the Father, no matter how far we stray away, no matter how much we have sinned, no matter how separated we are from God, He's going to continue to pursue. And He wants to bring us into covenant that He can show off then how much His love is for people. And, and marriage is the institution that He demonstrates that in. And so because of that, friends, the, the enemy, we have a very real enemy of our soul, He wants to attack marriages. And, and he has, and that is one of the primary ways that he's going to uh, try to destroy the image of God in this world. And so we have a real battle on our hands when it comes to marriage. And the enemy's going to try to hijack marriage. He wants to hijack sex. Do you know that? Did you know, come on, did you know that, that, that sex was God's idea? Let's go, amen, praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know. but, but the world and the enemy has hijacked it and perverted it. The enemy can't create anything. He's not creative at all. He only perverts what God creates. And so with everything that was created, there is something pure and whole and holy about it. And, um, and then there's also something that is distorted about it as well that the enemy has taken and he has siphoned off the wholeness of what God wants for all things, including, including sex. And, um, and, and that honestly right now is one of the biggest battlefields in culture. I would say almost primarily sex. And so um, you got to recognize that. Like God didn't just create sex for like just for procreation. This wasn't just like, a, okay, this is how we multiply, you know, and how we have kids. And, 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 and that is the, the case. Um, I can say it like a preacher if you want. God created sex not just for procreation, but for recreation. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> some of you are going to like write that. You're like make a sign in your bedroom or something, you know, but, um, but, but listen, just as Pastor Damon has talked about over the last couple of weeks, it's within the context of marriage. That's when it's, that's when it's done by God's design. And anything outside of that is going to lead to, it's going to lead to hurt. It's going to lead to harm. It's going to lead to deterioration and a fragmentation of our souls. And so we've got to understand that God, God has, he has invented this thing, Right. And he want, and he's also set it within the boundaries of marriage. One man, one wife for life. 
And in that, there, there is a purity and a wholeness. That's not to say that if any of our stories have diverged from that, that we can't experience healing and wholeness. That's not, that, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying we've got to understand what, where God has placed his blessing Amen. in God's ways. And, and I want for your marriages to thrive because I believe that the world needs to see marriages in the church thrive. Come on. Amen. Like I believe, I believe the world needs to see like, uh, like what, what is going on? Like they actually love each other. They serve each other. They support each other. They foster this beautiful uh, relationship where they, 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 they prop up each other's dreams and goals and uh, purposes in life. And like that's what the world needs to see. The world doesn't need to see self-preservation or backbiting or cynicism or critical nature. Like that's not, there's enough of that going on. It, the world needs to see something different with marriages. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about marriage. And, um, and I want to talk about how your marriage can be incredible. I'm not an expert at this, okay? So in all humility, I'm just going to tell you, I'm learning a whole lot through this. But I just want to bring forward some of what Scripture talks about. You know, we don't go into marriage with, with any kind of idea other than this grandiose, idyllic perspective of marriage, right? You plan your wedding and you plan, it's like, this is going to be, I, like a just, I just have this huge vision for how marriage is going to be, you know, and then, and then, and then sometimes it, does, it falls short of that. It, it falls short of our expectations. You ever had a moment in life where what you experienced fell short of your expectations? I had this a few years ago. In 2021, I decided to take my entire family, uh, so my wife and our three kids, at the time they were seven, six, and one and a half, on an RV trip out to Colorado. I'm not saying it was a good idea. I'm just saying I had an idea to do it. And it was on the coattails of 2020. You saw the stuff on Instagram where people were grabbing RVs and they were going out to Utah and to Colorado. And it just looked so idyllic and serene. And how many of you know, you can't trust anything that's on Instagram. Let's go. I didn't know that at the time, but I learned it because then I decided, oh, we're going to rent this 36 foot A class RV. I've got a picture of it right here. I'm going to show you the RV right, right here that we rented. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not like your newest and latest and greatest model, but it was a great, I mean, it was nice, big, beefy. And we're going to drive out from Indianapolis and we're going to go out to Colorado. We're going to spend two weeks making the circuit around Colorado, seeing all the sights with the kids, making a whole lot of memories. Oh, we made memories. All right. <laughs> We've got a partner church out there that does pain to purpose, and I was preaching out there. I thought it'd just be an easy way to kind of like parlay this into a great family vacation. And, and I'm telling you right now, that was, I'll never do it again. <laughs> Let me tell you about this, okay? We left, now just like everything, every trip of the Blackburns take, we leave hours after we intend to leave. Anybody like that, right? So we left at 5 p.m. This was like three or four hours later than what we expected from Indianapolis, drove out. We had to make a first stop in Kansas City. We finally are rolling into Kansas City about two in the morning, and I had to wake up super early the next day, get back behind the driver's seat, try to truck it all the way out to western Colorado because we had a deadline to get to my wife's family reunion. She hadn't seen this family in 15 years. And we're pulling into Denver, so it's not quite Western color. And I'm just dying because I just haven't had any sleep. I've been, you know, on the road. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so tired. So I call the partner church that's in Denver. I say, hey, can we uh, dry dock in your parking lot? Dry dock means no running water, like not, like not hooked up to anything. And so you got to understand, like we, we dry docked in Kansas City, dry dock now in Denver, waking up the next day to drive another four or five hours to get out to Western Colorado for this family reunion where we haven't seen this family. I've never met this family. And my wife hasn't seen this family in 15 years. And we're like, hey, pulling in like Chevy Chase, smelling all the goodness. 45 minutes before we pull in to this family reunion, our, son, our youngest, one and a half years old, gets car sick and pukes all over Christy. So we're like, hi, family. <laughs> and we just roll with it, right? That starts, our, I should have known it was a bad omen. That started our trip, okay? So we do the two weeks and we preach at this church in Denver, and it was great. I'm leaving after preaching the church in Denver. Our vacation's almost over. We're trying to get back to Kansas City after those two weeks to get to an amusement park so our kids could have the last hurrah at an amusement park. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Why do I do that? I have no idea. Maybe it's just because it's quieter in the RV or in any kind of car with three kids at 2 o'clock in the morning. Everybody's asleep in the back of the RV. My kid's back there. My wife is asleep in the passenger seat. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, Nowheresville, Kansas, you can actually look it up. It's called Russellville, Kansas. It is the absolute epitome of nothingness. 
Nowheresville, Kansas. I might have been going a little bit over the speed limit because I'm just trying to get there, you know, about 80 or so. And so I'm trucking along in this 36-foot A-class RV and a 10-point buck decides to step out onto the interstate in front of me. Now, you're not stopping a 36-foot RV. And so I slam the brakes on, and it propels my wife out of her sleepy stupor. All she can say in that moment is, why would you? And then, boom, we obliterate this deer. Like, liquidate it. You know what I mean? Like, some of you are like, there's like two different responses. Some of you are like, oh, Bambi, you know. Some of you are like, did you keep the meat? You know? No, I didn't have either one of those reactions. I'm now in the middle of an interstate with a 10-point buck dead right in front of me. I'm stopped. My wife goes, what are you doing? Step on it. She's concerned someone's going to rear-end us and the kids are back there. I'm concerned about... Bambi's dad that's sitting right here. I'm like, but she goes, I don't care. I slammed the gas on, go, 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 right, right. <laughs> you want to see what happened to this RV? Look, look at this. I've got a little video of what happened to this RV. Look at this. Yes, that is what you think it is. Um, I'm not, and it, so the next day I had to like, to take one of those at those self-serve wash plate with the wands and I had to like spray out all of the fur and guts and blood out of the radiator and there is a little kickback on that I'm just telling you I, I just it was bad we started out nasty we ended up nasty from dirt we come to dirt we return praise God for terrible vacations okay I'm uh, I, sometimes your expectations don't get met come on right Sometimes it, 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 you get really disappointed. And for me, that was a disappointment. And, and, and that's my RV story. But you might be like, David, that might be your RV story, but that's my marriage story. Come on, Mom. Come on. That's my life story. I started out thinking that there was going to be this grandiose, amazing thing. And, and my story has not gone the way that I thought it would go. My marriage has not gone the way that I thought it would go. And can I tell you something in here today? I want you to understand no matter where you're at, no matter what relationship status you have, no matter what your past is, we serve a God who restores. We serve a God who redeems. We serve a God who wants more for you and for your marriage than what you could ever ask or imagine. And I want to talk about in here today, how do we, no matter where we're at, like start clean, like wipe the slate clean, no matter where we're at, how do we have a marriage? How do we have relationships that exceed our expectations, not disappoint us, right? This is what scripture says in Ephesians chapter three. It says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more, other translations say exceedingly abundantly more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. I mean, we just sang about it, right? Maybe today is the day you stop operating in your power in your marriage and you let God's power come through. And so that's what God wants and desires for our marriages. That's what he wants and desires, listen to me, for your sex life. Amen. Hear me? But that's not what the enemy wants. The enemy of our soul, John 10.10, 10, tells us he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to siphon off the amazing wholeness that God has for your life and for your marriage. And he's going to do this. Listen to me. He's going to do this strategically and methodically, and we have to be on guard about this. Amen. So I want to talk to you about a few things that I've learned on how do we have a marriage and a, and a sex life that is just exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Again, I'm not an expert at this, but I do know that God's word talks about this. You see, God's word talks about sex. Did you know that? Do you know that? Yes, right? Some of you are like, really? how, what, Sister Mary Clarence, how is, <laughs> no. No, God's word talks about sex. I mean, you're going to go into this Song of Solomon study, and I'm telling you right now, men, if you have never led your marriage spiritually, if you've never initiated anything spiritually, this is the moment to initiate something spiritually and go to this Song of Solomon study, because you're going to learn a whole lot about what God's Word says about sex. You see, there's a book called the Song of Solomon that some people would say, theologians would, would contend, that it is purely and only an allegory of God's love for his church. Can we read some of this? 
Just let, listen, let's, let me show you this. Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden. Sorry, I failed to set the context for you here. <laughs> Quite literally, it says, beloved and lover. These are the two people talking right here. That his fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. <laughs> Enough said. We can pray and go home. All right? We can pray and go. Like that. I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound purely and only like an allegory of Christ's love for his church, okay? That sounds like what, that, that, what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> look at this, Song of Solomon 7. I told you we're going to have some fun today, okay? Verse 6, how beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of a palm. Your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said... <laughs> I will climb the palm tree and I will take hold of its fruit. Amen. Praise God. Listen, some, and some of you are offended. Can I tell you something right now? More than likely, the same people of you guys that are offended, quite possibly, you are caught up in some kind of deviant pornography addiction. You're totally fine with the world talking about this. I think it's time to take this back, friends. I think it's time to take back what God created and its holiness and talk about how do we have a holy marriage. Because you know, friends, marriage, marriage was, is not just for our happiness. You get, you get that? There are moments and seasons where there is, but man, mostly what marriage is, is marriage is for our holiness. Amen. That God has brought two people together that are very different, praise God. But also some of those things that attracted you in the very beginning are the very things that frustrate you as you get into it. And these are things that God is using and leveraging to actually make us more like him. What is the image of Christ that we see? We see the image of Christ, God being a man who lowers himself, stoops down, right? That he takes on this human flesh. As Philippians chapter 2 says, he does not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to be taken uh, as it, with his advantage, but to lower himself, to humble himself in the form of a servant and become obedient even to death on a cross. And so I, I'm, I'm telling you, friends, that in, in marriage, what God wants to do is he wants to make us holy. It is one of the primary means of sanctification in our lives. And so there's going to be some sharp, rough edges of your spouse that's going to chisel and chip away at you and vice versa. But what we've got to do is understand how do we create an environment where our sanctification can happen so that our marriage can be flourishing and whole. And the equation that I want to give you today is this. Intimacy, okay, intimacy. And I don't just mean physical intimacy. I mean all-encompassing, but we will talk about the physical today. Intimacy, it's, it's determined by or it's built by identity plus unity. Amen. Hear me? Identity plus unity. We've got to do two things. First, we have to find our identity in Christ. And secondly, we have to fight for unity with each other. Amen. Let's break those apart one at a time, okay? The first thing we have to do if we're going to have a thriving, exceedingly abundant marriage and sex life is we have to find our identity in Christ. And this starts from the very origins of time. We've got to see the way God set this up with the first man and woman is how he wants it to, to, to be, right? There are two chapters in scripture that show us how God designed things to be. And he designed it this way. It says in Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now you have God who says, let us make man in our own image. Who's he talking about when he says us? Is he talking to the angels? No, the triune God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons in one, all, listen, the, the embodiment of community, of relationship, says I want to create a being. But this being was created isolated. 
So the embodiment of relationship creates an isolated being. One, because he wants relationship, not because he needs humans, not because he needs some kind of creation, but because he wants to breathe his glory into humans and he creates this human isolated. Now, first you've got to understand that God wants us to have community. He has not built us to be by ourselves. Listen, I know there's a whole movement where it's like, I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. I don't need a man. I don't need, no, I don't, listen. It, I, there is a calling on some people's lives to be single. The apostle Paul called some to be, like he himself said, I would rather you, you're gonna be able to accomplish more for the kingdom single, but that's not most people's calling. The question I have for you is when you say, well, I don't need a man. Is it out of spite? Is that your trauma response? Is that like a, 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 a hurt, wounded response? Or is that actually a calling? Because a calling comes from a place of healing so you can breathe life into other people, not so you can talk, be toxic for other people, right? So like, like, but, but at the end of the day, God created man, and then he says this. He says, uh, he says but for Adam, no suitable helper was found because it says it is not good for man to be alone. Amen. If man is alone, think about the detriment of this. If man is alone, he will never wear deodorant. <laughs> he will wear his underwear until they are just shreds of linen and falling up. I mean, just he needs a helper. Come on. Amen. Who's going to help him navigate in the car? Sorry, I will joke around a little bit in this, okay? Try to discern what is joking, what is truth, okay? Just try to discern that. It's not good for man to be alone, okay? But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. He closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of a man. He brought her to the man. Okay, look, look. God creates Adam. Who is Adam's first relationship? God, okay? His identity is set. He is declared, this is, your, this is your being, this is your personhood by God, okay? God creates woman from man to ultimately bring her back to man from flesh, right? By the way, woman, you're the only thing that was not created out of dirt. Amen. Like, Amen. Like, like, ladies, do you understand how sacred and precious you are and cherished in God's sight. Come on. You hear that? You're the only thing in his creation that was not created from dirt. Amen. And so it creates it out of man so then be brought back into man. Who was Eve's first relationship with? God, not Adam. Adam was asleep. Amen. God's like, I gotta get you out of the equation. You're gonna mess this up, bro. <laughs> Eve's first relationship was with God. Hear me. You and I can never have a strong foundation in relationships, dating, marriage, otherwise, if our first relationship isn't with God. I need you to hear me say this. Your first love is Jesus. That's it. He is the only person that's going to fully and finally satisfy you. We have a God-sized void inside of our heart that no man, no woman, no person, no community, no job, no excelling, no success, nothing can satisfy you like Jesus can. And so God creates us, sorry Jerry Maguire, not to complete each other, but to complement each other. But hear me. I want to call out some of the frustration you already have in your marriage. He's not being what you need him to be. She's not giving what you need her to give. And it's part of the design. Because she can't. He can't. Like, like he cannot be the object of your worship to fully and finally satisfy you. So strategically, there's gonna be some things about him that are gonna like, like it's gonna annoy you. And like he's not gonna, he's gonna have some gaps. Not so you can call it out in him and be negative and nagging, but so you can find the satisfaction that you need fully and finally with him. 
Listen, I'm telling you, he is not your savior. She is not your savior. And the moment you begin to do that, now there is a it, very tricky, it's very deceitful what the enemy can do to cause a codependent relationship to happen here. Like somehow we're supposed to be dependent on each other like partners and yet maintain our personhood and follow after Jesus. And as we're following after Jesus, as we are, like, like you understand that when you stand in front of Jesus, you are accountable for your relationship with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Like you, right? Like you're not gonna, you're, I, that I know of, you're not gonna stand there with your, your spouse. Amen. You can't pass the blame for like you and Jesus. Come on. Right? Adam tried to. He tried to be like, when God said, what, what did you do right here with this fruit? Why did you eat the fruit? He goes, well, the, the woman that you gave me, God. God, I don't, I, like, I couldn't, I mean, what am I supposed to do? I, you gave me a naked woman, she's got a fruit plate. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> See, I'm just gonna mix a little bit of joking in with a little bit with the truth, you know, okay. You can't, like, God goes, no, you can't pass the blame on that one. Like, like you and I, we, you gotta be accountable. And then he goes to Eve, well, what have you done? And she goes, well, the, the snake. No, you can't pass the, like, boats were, so listen, you're accountable. You, you are your own person. Amen. And, and you have to be a whole person if you're going to be able to help make your part of this relationship thriving. Amen. So that means you're, like, the most important thing is you pursuing after Jesus. I want you to think about, like, a triangle, okay? Think about, think about Jesus being at the top of this triangle. Think about each one of you guys being at the base of the triangle. And think about, like, a rubber band in between the two of you guys. As you both pursue after Jesus, what happens to you to the, together? You get closer, right? If, if either one of you are pursuing kind of in your own direction, what happens? The tension gets drawn on that rubber band, Right? The tension's gonna ha there's gonna be tension in your relationship if you are not humbly each submitting yourselves to a relationship with Jesus. That's the fertile ground for intimacy, is you having your identity in Christ. Singles, if you're listening to this, I know we're gonna do a message on singleness next week. You've got to understand your identity has to be first and foremost in Christ. You've got to become the person that, that you're looking for is looking for. Do you, you follow that? Like, you're looking for Mr. Right. No, like, you become Mrs. Right. And then as you're chasing after Jesus, just like if you see someone right next to you that's chasing as hard and as fat, okay, that's the, that's the group you want to look at. So many of you are like, you're putting your hand to the plow and you're looking back and you're like, but is there anybody going to come? And it's like, no, 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 leave them, leave them. Amen. They're not going to, because they're not going to satisfy you. I promise, like, it's going to, it's going to be bad. So, so we've got to build our relationship with, with God first. Amen. There is one. There is the one. You know, you know that? Like the one. His name is Jesus. <laughs> like there is, there's nobody else that's going to complete you in this life. Amen. And, that's, and the reason this is important is because primarily intimacy, before it's physical and before it's emotional, it's spiritual. Amen. This is a spiritual thing, guys. And so, so we see this, Song of Solomon 4.12. The, the lover is talking to his beloved. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Like he is cherishing and valuing her purity. And he wants to protect her purity at all costs. Because he knows that violating her purity is, is going to violate her soul. You hear me? Like, I get it, guys. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you right now. Like, the, this is the second service, so I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to keep it real. But, like, when, after being married and, and having a just incredible, not perfect, but incredible sex life, and then being widowed and trying to figure out, like, how to shut that off and, you know, like, all of the, it's just hard, right? And it's just, like, and then, you, and then you've got, then you've got this, as I've met Christy, and there's this passion that, like, I mean, when you have been wounded and you have lost and then you, now that gets turned back on, like it is, on. hold on, whoa. Amen. But can I tell you something? Like, I haven't done everything right, okay? I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But, but one of the things that I, I told Christy, I said, I said, I'm not, like, we're not gonna go there and I'll be the one to initiate stopping. Amen. Like, I'm not gonna let this. And, and she, to this day, if she was standing here, she'd be like, that was one of the, the most um, uh, special ways that he could have cherished my heart. Amen. 
and it helped me feel safe Amen. to know that he was not going to violate Amen. my purity or pressure or, or, right? Like together, like if you're dating together, like you guys can fight this thing together. Amen. You don't know, just, it doesn't need to be just one of you being like, no, I got to pump the brakes. I got to like, no, like this, because it's spiritual first. Amen. It's spiritual first. And so it says that you're a, you're a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from the Lebanon. And, and, and so like, what he means by a well of flowing water is like life is supposed to flow from this. And, and, and what just breaks my heart is that for so many of us, when we think of sex, we don't, like, especially in church, we don't think of life. Amen. We think of shame Come on. and condemnation. And, and we, we think, man, like, I don't know if I could ever, I don't know if God could ever, like, see me as whole because of this. And I, I need you to hear me say, listen, in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like today, like everything, all of your mistakes, all of your sin, all of your shame, all of it can, can be wiped away, like power wash, like gone as far as the east is from the west is what's going He remembers it no more. And it just, it's, it's just repenting and, and saying, God, I'm going I'm to do this your way now, Amen. not my own way. And then in verse 16, Song of Solomon 4 says, awake, north wind, come, south wind, blow on my, you know, all of that stuff we read earlier. It's like, but it starts spiritual. It starts with guarding purity. Amen. And, and listen, this means in marriage as well, friends. Like, like, I can't tell you how many, I mean, what is riddling and destroying marriages right now more than anything else is pornography. Because of, because of how easily accessible it is. And I know, like, especially men, and I know it's not just isolated men. There's plenty of women who are, who are battling this as well. But, like, I just, I don't, have, I don't have time to go into all of this, but I just want you to know, like, this, this is affecting your marriage. Amen. And, and, and it is affecting, more importantly, your soul. Amen. Because you are, like, very subtly, you're beginning to objectify the other person. And that is not going to, to, to breed a life-giving sex life. Amen. It's not going to happen. So whatever you have to do, like the eyes are the lamp to the body. Whatever you have to do, just eliminate, like get rid of the computer, the phone, like put as many blockers as you can. Just stop because out of, like God wants life to come from, 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 your, from your sex life and not destruction or shame or Okay, so um, I don't have much, I don't have time to like go into all that. I just want to, like, I felt like I really needed to press into that right here. Um, the second thing that really helps with intimacy, right? The second, so we've got, a, I, our identity has to be built in Christ. But when we fight for unity with each other, Amen. when we fight for unity with each other, because it's not just spiritual, intimacy is also emotional, right? What I mean by unity is, I mean like, I mean friendship, partnership, like, you, like this is what it says. It says, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a, what's that word? helper suitable for him, okay? That word helper often and over the history of the church has been misconstrued and it's been kind of like used and abused for like power and authority. Uh, it, it can tend to be, especially women, and I, I wanna apologize for this, it can tend to be used by men to say like, okay, uh, Bible says you gotta submit. So now you're subservient to me. I'm sorry, that's, that's totally proof texting what the Bible says. You see in the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says wives submit to your husbands. Yes, it does say that, but it says it on the coattails of each one of you should submit first to God and then mutually submit to each other. And then Ephesians chapter 5 says wives submit to your husbands, but it also says before that, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, doing what? Giving himself up for her. What did Jesus do for the church? He died for her. Like, died for her. So there are women in here, you're like, I'm not submitting to no man. And like, listen, the men have a higher calling on this. He's supposed to die to, like, for you. Like, to, to all of his dreams, to all of his desires, to his agenda, to his calendar. Like, and you can, listen to me, you can, if you want a toxic relationship, you can use that stuff against each other. Or, or you, can, you can each take your responsibility in following God's ways and think about the beauty of a relationship when the husband is completely dying to himself and the woman is submitting herself. Come on. Like, this is literally the arguments are like, no, no, no. Like, how can I sacrifice and serve you? Yeah. 
That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? That's not typically what happens. So the Hebrew word for helper, what it's, what it's showing us is actually the, the connotation of this. The concept is two, two opposing forces is what helper means. Hear me? It's not like one force that's subservient to the other. It's two opposing forces that lean on each other, that need each other in order for the other one to pro- be propped up. That's what the word helper means. Now, there are some times where life looks more like this, and there are other times that life looks more like this. But you have to understand, this is the concept right here, is that we're leaning on each other, that there, is, there are certain distinctions about you that is, is opposing to, in a good way, in a healthy way, in an honoring way, your partner. Like God created you differently for a reason, Right? There are some things that, that Christy, my wife, is absolutely gifted with that I am terrible at, okay? She's got an incredible gift of discernment. I am so aloof. I trust everybody. <laughs> I'm just like, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, come on. You know, I'm just like, every, like everybody's good. And she's like, uh, no, right? And so sometimes in the beginning, before I learned to trust her discernment, she would oppose. And she'd be like, no, I don't think we need to, right? She would, and this gift of discernment was coming out. And, and, and I didn't honor that, I'm ashamed to say. Come on. And, and so I've had to like retract and apologize a, a ton. And now I've learned, oh, I trust your gift of discernment. There's something about how God brought us together to be opposing forces to each other. And so it helps us, especially if you're polarizing, like if, if you have like kind of that polarizing type personalities, it brings you more to the middle to become more like the image of Christ. Got it? So it says we, we, we have to have a, a helper. But what happened with the fall in Genesis 3, it says to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe with painful labor. You will give birth to children. That's kind of a crummy part of the fall. Um, <laughs> amen, right, ladies? I have not been there personally, but I've watched my beautiful, beautiful, wonderful, amazing, courageous bride do it without uh, any kind of intervention, any kind of... Um, uh, medication, and that was, she was unbelievable, okay? But it says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. This is part of the fall. The Hebrew of that does not, it, it, we, it, we get lost in translation. What it means is, you will desire to rule over your husband, and he will rule over you. Amen. So rather than these complementing opposing forces that are honoring of each other, you're going to compete for authority, do you see what's happening? You can see this all throughout our society. There is a competition for who actually stands in a place of authority in our marriage. Who wears the pants in the relationship, right? To borrow the old adage, right? And this is a, this is a massively, like, it is permeating our culture. So, like, across the board, with extreme toxic mas- masculinity all the way to extreme feminism, right? These two ideas are permeating our culture because the enemy wants us to vie for authority against each other. Because it's out of self-preservation. Now we're guarded. And the only way that we can have a good marriage and intimacy is if our guard is down and instead of self-preservation, we're acting in self-sacrifice. Where we honor each other. Where we defer to each other. Where, like, like this isn't about compromise. This is about unity. There's a difference. Hear me? There's a difference. So that means if we're not unified on something, we go to the Lord and we, and we okay, Lord, help, help us. Like, we want to we fall subservient to you, Holy Spirit. Okay? So that kind of lays the groundwork for some things. I want to get really practical within, with, with this. And so it says that the Lord God made a woman from the rib who had been taken out of a man, and he brought her to the man. The woman said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She'll, she shall be called woman. And, and you know why, because... When God, when, when Eve walked down the aisle, she, you know, she was naked and Adam's like, he did, there was nothing else that could come out of his mouth other than, whoa, man. So he named her woman, right? Um, men are not that creative, okay? I just want you to know that um, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. The word united in the Hebrew is dabak, which means cling or adhere, but, but more importantly, to catch by pursuit. See this? Like you have to pursue unity by pursuing each other. Amen. Okay? And here's what I've found when it comes to especially um, uh, sexuality in marriage is that 
we get things really backwards because we're pursuing our desires and our agenda Amen. rather than pursuing the desires and the agenda of the other person in the, in the partnership. So, so we're not acting as friends, right? We're, at, we're acting selfishly. And so men, you're pursuing, uh, typically, this is not, this is an overgeneralization, I understand that. Typically, it's the men who are pursuing physicality. They're, they connect more physically, right? And, and typically, it's women. Not, all the, not always, okay? I just want you to know, this is not always the case. Women are pursuing emotionally. They want, they, they feel connected emotionally, okay? So what we have to do is we have to put down our own desires and we have to attune ourselves to the other person's desires. Got that? So men, let me, let me start with you, okay? Um, when was the last time, married men, that you pursued your wife? Like the way, the way that you pursued her when you were dating? See, what men typically do is they pursue and once they Men are conquerors by nature. Once they conquer, they stop pursuit. Okay, you got to understand this is like, you got to redeem that fleshly side of you, okay? So it's great that you are wired to pursue and conquering. You've got to recognize you have never conquered your wife. There is way more to learn about her, to study about her, to be inquisitive about her, to be curious about her, to like pursue her heart. So when was the last time you sat down and dated your wife and said, I, I just wanna, I wanna know how you're feeling about this, babe. Amen. Some of you men are like, I can't ask her her feelings. She tells it to me enough as it is. You know, like, no, no, seriously. Like, how do you feel about this? How do you feel like right now? And then listen, Listen to her, reflect back to her, don't try to solve it as a problem. Can I get an amen from the one? Learn her. You are a lifelong learner of your bride. You're like, but she's so complex. And yes, that's why you're a lifelong learner of your bride, and that's the beauty of it. Like, there's something so beautiful about you being her person and knowing her heart more than anybody else. It's almost like it's an actual friendship. Amen. And I'm telling you, like, what develops then physically out of friendship, men, just, I'm, women, I'm sorry, but I just, I'm trying to, I'm gonna speak to the motivation of the men for a second. What, what develops physically is, uh, is unbelievable but it starts from friendship. My mom used to say, Davey, sex starts in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it does, you know? And then it moves to the living room and, you know. My mom's like, no, no. No, Davey, you, you, you partner with her, like responsibilities and like, you, like help to eliminate all of the drag that's happening with all the checklists and the to-dos, like be a part of all of this Amen. with her. And, and man, I'm still learning that. And, and, I, and I have to constantly ask that, like, what can I do in this season that will help to eliminate stress or distress from your heart, Amen. right? That right there, man, I'm telling you, like you go after that, it's incredible. And so you've got to be partners in this. There's a, this is a, there's a partnership, all right? You guys still good? I've got a little bit more I want to share practically. So what this means in partnership is that uh, as friends, we, we have to think about how we think about each other and how we talk to each other and talk about each other. Amen. So it'd be very easy for you because you know your person better than, than anybody else knows their person. It'd be very easy for you to pick out and nitpick all of the things you don't like about your person oh. and to begin to call that out in your person. And can I tell you something? That's not like, that's not going to do anything. It, that's, that, that's not edifying for your person. It's actually going to, um, nagging and like picking out the, the bad in someone is actually gonna cause them to be deflated and defeated. Amen. And so they're not gonna have any motivation. Like we are motivated by like celebration. So practical, what you celebrate will get replicated. Amen. All right, so if wives, if your husband like comes out and helps, you know, take the groceries and you're like shocked by that rather than being like, well, it's about time. You know, you never do this, right? Having all this like language, by the way, in arguments, don't have that kind of definitive, never, you always, like, no, 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 no. no that, like that's, 
that's grounds for, I mean, that's going to destroy communication there. But instead of like nagging him in that moment, celebrate that moment. Thank you. Oh, baby, thank you so much for carrying that grocery bag in. Man, your muscles pop (laughs) in that shirt when you, I promise you, you celebrate him. We are, we are not, we are very primitive beings. Like he will be like, I'll take that Campbell's soup. And I'm like, come on, baby, I'll I'll carry the groceries in all the time. He just want, like, he, he wants to feel affirmed. The reason that he works all the time is because he gets affirmed at work. Amen. Come on. Like, he's famous at work. You, you can help him be famous at home. I know he's got his part. He has his part. But you can help cultivate reasons for why he would want to be at home rather than at work. Amen. Okay? Hear me? So, now... Uh, men, like the way you talk to and the way you talk about your, like, men, you should be the softest, most tender person in your wife's life. Amen. You hear me? Like, like you should never, there should never be like a strong, harsh word. Now I get it. It happens. In that moment, you need to apologize, confess, because the way we talk about each other and the way we talk to each other says so much, says so much about how we respect and revere and cherish each other. And out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you can't just pass it off and go, well, I just call it like it is. That's just who I am. Well, who I, who you are sucks. Ephesians 4.29 says, let's not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. Only that which is for building others up. And man, you can diffuse a situation really quickly, an argument, a conflict, if you just, a kind word, right? Like step back, downregulate, take a moment if you have to. Then come back together and say, hey, let's talk about this as if we're fighting with each other against a common enemy that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy in our marriage. I mean, there's just, let me give you a few things. Like most marriages, they're going to have conflict over a certain topics right here. Um, finances is gonna be one of them. So the, I, I need you to ask yourself, are you partnering in your finances? It doesn't matter who runs the books or who, you know, like it doesn't matter, right? To whatever gift it best fits that. But what matters is that you're making those decisions together. And I'm not going to tell you, man, I'm not going to be pharisaical about this, but I, I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't have separate bank accounts and all that kind of, like, I know there's a lot of complicated situations, okay? I, I just want, like, are you making decisions together? Like, like when you marry, you, like, you're, you're marrying everything about that person, including the debt that they bring in, including the assets that they bring in. These are ours now. And if you want to start marriage out with a contract, that's fine, but that's not, that's not breeding grounds for intimacy and vulnerability, right? Like marriage is a covenant. What, 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 did, what happened with God's covenant to us? His only son. Like he laid down his entire life. He wasn't worried about the assets that he had or the, like the debt. No, he paid the debt. He's like, forget it. Like it's done, it's paid in full. And so like, I just want you to think about that. Um, Kids, I mean, so many marriages will end in divorce because of kids. Like philosophies of parenting. You, You need to talk about those things together. Like you need to have an approach together. Go, okay, this is how we're going to handle this situation with this kid. This is how we're going to, and talk about those things. Husbands, participate in that, right? It is not like your wife's job to just raise the kids. I don't care if you, listen, I'll blow it up right now. I don't care if you are the sole provider. Your kids need you, husbands. They need you. They need you. Did you know, like, 
80% of the crime in our city is because of fatherlessness. Fatherlessness. And that's not just a, a, like an abandoning dad. That's like a neglecting dad too. Like be in all of this, okay? The Holy Spirit can give you strength, not by your own power, by your own might, but his. Your time, your calendar. You've got to talk about these things. One of the best pieces of advice that was ever given to us when it came to marriage was every week, have a date night. Prioritize that. Before you put anything else on the calendar, have a date night. It's fine if you plan it sometimes, Davey. It's fine fine if you plan it sometimes, Chris. It doesn't matter, but have a date night where you reconnect without the kids. Every week, have a business meeting. Hear me? Every week, have a business meeting. You sit down, you talk about your calendars, talk about your schedule, do your outlook, do all of that kind of stuff. Talk about the, the business of the home, okay? And if you begin to like operate ahead of things, because there's going to be all kinds of things that come out, you begin to get strategic ahead of things, then it provides margin for the relational side of stuff. But if you're just like hitting every, you know, uh, every groundhog that pops up and you're just boom, 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 every, putting out every fire, like, like that's going to be a lot of, that's going to be stressful in your marriage, and your relationship. So get ahead of it. Have a business meeting every single week. Okay. Have, have a, a getaway every quarter without your kids that you plan ahead for the next quarter. We just, Christy and I just started implementing this and it's amazing. We go, okay, what's our rallying cry as a family? Like, what are we all together as a family going after so that we're pursuing the same thing? What are our dreams and our goals? What are the things that we need to do? What are the roles or rules of our household that, that we need to do in order to implement this plan for the next 90 days? Is there anything that needs to switch or adjust? Because life changes. Your roles are going to change within everything. But you've got to communicate about that. Men, lead the way in this. Say, hey, how are we going to get a sitter for an overnighter where we can go and we can just reconnect together, right? Do, do that every quarter. And then every year, go on a vacation, maybe a week, four days, whatever you can do without your kids, okay? Let me tell you this. Your relationship together is a higher priority than your relationship with your kids. Your relationship with your kids are important, okay? But, but listen, they're going, to they're going to be out of your house at some, praise God, they're going to be out of your house <laughs> at some point. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to look at your person and go, I don't know you anymore. Because we've been operating side by side for so long, we never got face to face. And if you don't get face to face in very periodic, intentional places, you'll just keep operating side by side and you'll wake up one day and you're back to back. You're strangers, you're not friends anymore. So how do we develop this friendship, right? Because what, what that does then is then, number three, we'll experience intimacy like never before. We'll experience intimacy like never before. Because it starts spiritually. Then it starts, then it comes emotionally, connecting emotionally, pursuing each other in that friendship together. Whatever it is that he needs, whatever it is that she needs emotionally, like pursuing those things together. And then you can get into the physical. Like then the physical kind of comes as a byproduct of this. And the physical is beautiful. It's amazing. It's wonderful, right? Like there's some incredible stuff. Like marriage, the, the marriage bed is sacred. Anything goes within the confines of marriage, right? If it's you, one wife, one, one man, one wife for life, anything goes. And so like maybe husbands, maybe you need for a season to stop pressuring, to stop like your only touch being a sexual touch. Do you know what? Do you know what NST is, husbands? Non-sexual touch. Like, just give her a hug with no, with like, with no agenda. Give her a kiss with no agenda, right? I know it's gonna be difficult for you, but... <laughs> like, think about her heart more. Look at Song of Solomon. I know, we got, I got a little, this is second service, so I didn't say this, but the Song of Solomon, this is what he does, look, this is what he does, Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1, it, he starts by looking at her eyes. It says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Do you see this? It starts by look, like connecting with her soul. 
Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built. I guess that was attractive. I mean, like a really... I, so built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them. Like he starts with her eyes connecting with her soul and then he works his way down, okay? Um, w- men, women, for the most part, this is a generalization, but for the most part, they, they need to know you're with them emotionally before anything physically can and will transpire. Women, one of the ways that you can help him be there emotionally is to initiate the physical. Got it? Married couples? I'm not talking to you dating couples, okay? <laughs> like, just, just think about it. Like, the fastest way to get him home from work? S- slide in on his DMs, you know? Like, like seriously, send him something. I promise he will stop what he did. He will, be, he will be home right away, right? Like, some of you are like, I don't know if I could do that, Davey. Like, I, I, I might feel dirty if I do that. Listen, he is praying right now, God, make her dirty, you know? <laughs> there is just some... <laughs> Was that over the line? <laughs> I'm sorry. I... I want you to know, I want you to know that God, want, God wants a, this beautiful blessing on your sex life. Like this isn't taboo. We don't have to like tiptoe around this. It's, it's, when it's whole and it's pure, God, it's beautiful. And I think what just breaks my heart is that that's not, the world has just fragmented it so much. And, and my prayer is, is that as we really pursue after our identity in Christ and fight for unity with each other, then we would get to experience that intimacy, that into me you see, like that friendship. And just that redemptive, beautiful thing. Well, we can take back territory from the enemy. My wife texted me this morning on the way over here. Maybe she just knew that I needed a little bit extra support. She said, you really are my best friend. I want that for all of us because the world needs to see that. Because when the world sees that and we go, listen, it's not by my own strength or by, like it's because of, it's only because I know the unconditional love of Christ that I can be okay with laying myself down and sacrificing and then something upside down happens where it just brings so much healing and beauty and wholeness when we sacrifice ourselves. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's stand together. And um, I just want let, I, I wanna give us a moment. I wanna give us a moment here. And uh, I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And then, and then I want to ask um, our prayer team to go ahead and come forward. And um, here's what I want to do. I'm not going to make a big to-do to about this, but I, 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 I believe in this service. I didn't do this last service, but I believe in this service. There are some couples that are in here that you just need to, there needs to be a moment, like a critical juncture where you draw a line in the sand and you respond. And uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to draw this out. I'm not going to make this emotional whatsoever. But in this time, some of you, you have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit that something needs to change in your marriage, that, that repentance needs to happen, forgiveness maybe. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to presuppose that. But I just wonder if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, I, I just wonder if you and your spouse, you would just take your spouse by the hand and you would come forward and you would just make this place your altar. And you would come pray together. Like maybe this is the first time you have ever prayed together. <laughs> That's fine. Like you don't even have to pray with one of our prayer team. If you want to, you can. But maybe you just want to make this moment and this space sacred to pray together. And so let me just, let me just right now, I want to just invite you to do that. If you feel like there was something today 
that I know I've got to walk out of here and there's going to be some shifts. There's going to be something different about our marriage. Let's go and let's solidify it together. So go ahead, come, come down if that's you. Come on down. Keep every head bowed and every eye closed. This doesn't even mean there's something wrong with your marriage. There doesn't, you know, someone might be like, what, what, is other, what are other people going to think about us in our marriage? Like they think we have it all together. Listen, no, no marriage has it all together. All this means that there was something that happened in your heart today that said, you know, we need to make an adjustment. But we need the power of God to do that. We can't do it on our own strength. We've been going in circles. We've just been at arguments and frustration and just we feel stuck we just need the power of God to step into our marriage that's that's all I'm that's all I'm asking if that's you if you feel like you need to put a stake in the ground draw a line in the sand come forward Amen. Amen. I want to pray for you, those of you guys who are up here. And I'm so proud of you for, because I think you're going to remember this moment. You know, it's not because you walked up here. It's because you responded to the call of God on your life. And so I just want to pray over you that he would seal that, that he would do something right now in this moment. So God, would you do that? Would you just, would, would this not be something that we forget when we leave from here? Would it not be something that we let life creep in and busyness creep in and all the things that we have to respond to and the kids and all that? Like, would this moment right here be a sacred moment, a moment that, that really is a defining moment? moment, a critical juncture where we see things differently after this moment, where our perspective is different, where our, our heart is different, where our eyes see things differently. We don't see the negative in our spouse anymore. We, we see the positive. Would you open up our, our eyes to focus on, on, on the, the good of our spouse and to, to call that out and affirm that and to edify each other and to support each other and to be a safe space for each other and to, to be able to downregulate in arguments, to be able to, 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 to really just breathe life into all of our conversations. Would, would we have a, a, a sweet vulnerability, a sweet spirit about our friendship? Would there be just a different nature of how we walk out of here. We're a different creation. We are changed and transformed because of you, Jesus. Not by our own strength, not by our own might. We don't trust in tips and tricks of the world. We trust in the Holy Spirit power that is infused in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, raises our marriages right now, raises our souls, can make us new people, can give us a new perspective, can transform our hearts. And so we call on that right now. We ask that this would be concrete, that it would be galvanized, solidified in the hearts of every person who's come forward. And we ask that they would be different people as they leave. Flourish marriages, bless marriages, so the world looks at the blended church and sees something different, something distinct, something new, something rich, something desirable, something enticing, something that speaks and breathes of you, Jesus. And I pray that your name and your renown would ripple across the city and this world because of the marriages right here in this room. We thank you, Jesus, for the work that you've done in this room. We thank you for the work you've done in our lives. And we ask all of this in the holy and precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, can we give Jesus a hand for what he's done in here? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Guys, I love you. Next week, we got a great message on singleness. Thanks for sticking in with me. I hope this has been